Today our foundational text will be from Philippians chapter 4 starting with verse 4 to verse 9. Philippians chapter 4 starting with verse 4 to verse 9. It will be our foundational text. Paul writes this while he is in a prison cell for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He writes it to the church of Philippi, a church he loves and encourages And in this last closing part of his letter, notice what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say to you, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, if there is any praise, Dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. May God bless the reading of His Word. It's amazing that Paul says here, and I I tell you, reading this and loving God's Word, it's amazing what he says just in verse 4. He says, Rejoice how? Rejoice in the Lord? Always. He doesn't say just rejoice whenever you got the front parking place at Walmart. You know, I, I've had this thing with my wife when we're shopping and it's always interesting and I'm sure some of you are like me that when you're trying to find a parking spot, you go out shopping and you go to the mall and you'll walk 10 miles but yet you don't want to walk but 5 feet from the door of your car to the door of the store. And One day, I've always said, we find a parking spot close, and I'll say, now look at the Lord. And I rejoice over that. But you know what? We should rejoice in all things. Let me tell you what it means to rejoice. It does not mean that we are thinking about just the things that are good. We need to realize that God loves us and that God is in control, and we can rejoice because we know this, is that yes, it could be worse, and I've heard that statement made, but we can rejoice because we know it's going to be better. Come on now. I've heard too many people in my life say, well, it could be worse. How many of you said that like me? It could be worse. Next time that thought comes in your mind, maybe you ought to do this. I know it's going to get a whole lot better. That sounds better to me. And so today I want just to talk to you for a few moments about what Paul was saying here in this text in Philippians chapter 4. I want to speak to you about the battle that goes on in our mind. Did you know right now that there is a battle raging in the mind of every person here on this earth? There's a battle raging. And what the battle is, is to control our thought life. You see, every sin that has ever been committed started first with a thought. Now you think of that. Every single sin that has ever been committed started with a thought. Someone that goes into a dollar store, pulls out a gun, and robs that place, they didn't just happen to stumble in there and happen to pull out a gun. They thought about what they were going to do and what they were going to get. Every man who's looked at a woman that was not his wife and he pursued her and and did what he should not be doing, it started that adultery with a thought. You see, everything in our life is a thought process. And the devil knows that you as believers in Jesus Christ, he cannot steal your salvation. He cannot take you out of the hands of God. But he will do everything he can to play with your mind. Some of you know what it means with someone playing with your mind. 
I heard a young girl one time, I was sitting in the store, at, where it was actually in a place that you're eating, and she leans over to her boyfriend, and she looks at him, and she says, are you playing with my mind? Some of y'all can relate to that, can't you, when people play with our minds. But you know what? The devil is constantly wanting to have war in our minds. And how do we know this? We know because Satan wants you to focus in on the darkness. Satan wants you to focus in on the defeat. Satan wants you to focus in on everything that is dead and depressing. And why? Because if he can get your mind focused on what is wrong, then what happens then is our whole attention and our whole will will go towards that direction. Christmas can be a wonderful time of the year. The poinsettias, the trees, the presents, the caroling, the parades, everything that goes with Christmas. But do you know statistically during this month of December that there is more suicide attempts that happen than the other 11 months of the year. You might say, well, how can that be? With with the the lights shining brightly and with everyone so excited and, and the man out there ringing the bell for the Salvation Army, everything's in the spirit. But how many of you know there's still people that are very depressed and it just gets worse sometimes during this time of year? Satan wants to play and wage war on your minds. The Paul says that we are to rejoice and rejoice always. And so when we are in a spiritual battle, and when Satan is trying to play games with us, we need to rejoice that God will fight our fights. We can rejoice in that. Now, it does not mean as a believer in Jesus Christ, you will never have a bad thought. I'm not even going to ask you that are saved, have you had a bad thought this week? I probably would say maybe some of you had a bad thought today. Who knows? Last night, something very interesting happening at my house. Well, actually, it's not my house. It's your house. It's the parsonage. It's God's house. But you know, I was in there, living in it, with my wife, and I said to her, which normally I had to say, will you bump the heat down? I said to her, is the heat on? Yes, the heat's on. Go look, and guess what? It's not working. So we bundle up in this one room and have a little heater and shut the doors, and she makes whatever arrangements for the next day. She does what she does, and and you know what? The whole time we're sitting there and teeth are chattering and warming up with each other, trying to get warm. And so we started saying, oh, how horrible this is. Oh, how bad this is. And then I tell you, a little craziness got into me. I said, I feel like just getting up and shouting and saying, maybe I need to just go ahead and preach my sermon right now and get warm. Because I know there might be some hot air coming out, right? You know. I mean, you know, I could have sat there and moaned and groaned and complained. But I thank God that we had someone we could call to come and fix the problem. And I got heat now in the house. <laughs> but do you get what I'm saying is that we can look at a problem and we can allow that problem to defeat us or we can rejoice that we have someone to turn to. Come on now. Some of you are going to get that whenever you're laying in the hospital bed and you complain about the bill for the specialist. But maybe you need to praise God and thank Him that there is a specialist that can take care of you. Here's what it says. It says that when we're in this battle, in verse 8, it says here's what we're to do. It says, finally, brothers, whatever's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, it says this, dwell or think on these things and do what you have learned and received and heard and seen to me, and the God of peace will be with you. So when you're tempted to focus in on all that's not pure and all that's not lovely and all that's not true, Paul says that you need to refocus your mind. Why? 
because that's where the battle is. When he says, think on these things, because he knows Satan will try to defeat you. So today, if you're taking notes, let's go through this very quickly, and that way we can look at God's Word and absorb it. But let's, let's just look at it real quick. One, in the battle, you need to have a plan of action, okay? If you just go in the battle of your mind and you don't have a plan, Satan will, he will play games. He is the master manipulator. He is the master deceiver. Uh, some of us think of Satan being with a pitchfork and, and uh, horns, but he is a beautiful angel. He's a fallen angel, and he will mislead you if you allow him. And so let me give you a battle plan, not from me, but from God's Word. One, when we're in the battle of the mind, first thing we need to do is learn to test every thought. Test those thoughts. Do you know just because the thought came to you, does not mean you got to act on it. Amen? Yes. I can remember teaching third grade. Did one year of lateral entry teaching and then third grade and a little girl come up to me. She said, Mr. Smith, she said, Bobby's getting on my nerves. I said, he's getting on your nerves. Why? He keeps pulling my hair. And she had pigtails. Keeps pulling my hair. Said, I'm milking the cow. I mean, she was upset about it. I said, well, I haven't seen him do it, sweetie. I said, but if I see him do it, now I'm going to get on him. So, I, you know, I'm going to watch him. I said, I'm, I'm sorry. She said, you know what it makes me think I need to do? I said, what does it make you feel like you should do? Because, you know, a third grader, it's interesting listening to him, isn't it? She said, I think that when he pulls my hair like that, Mr. Smith, I think I want to turn around and slap him hard. I said, well, let me tell you, sweetie, just because you think it doesn't mean that you should do it. How many of you know that you have thoughts come to you that you need to test by the Word of God? Just because you think you ought to tell somebody off doesn't mean you should tell them off. Amen? Right? Just because you think, well, I'm going to tell them, give them a piece of my mind. Really? How about give them a piece of the Word of God? Amen. Come on now. Because your mind is corrupted without Jesus. You know, if we stoop down to the same level as that person that's talking so ugly, so deceitful, so dirty, and we respond that way, then we're no better than they are. And yet the Bible says we are to reflect Jesus. You see, we are to do what? Test every thought that comes to our mind. That's what Psalm 139 verse 23 and 24 says, that we are to test those thoughts. So if it comes to you, don't just say, oh, this must be from God. Because guess what? Satan can whisper in your ear also. He can whisper in your ear also. I've canceled in the past 20 years of being a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've canceled people and they say, well, I just thought about it and thought about it and I wasn't happy at home and I just thought about how good it would be to do something and leave home. And I'll tell you, my friends, we need to test those thoughts. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need to remember in a battle, Ephesians 6, 17 says that we are to be armed for battle and put on the helmet of salvation. You know why it's the helmet of salvation? It's not because your salvation, as I said, can be taken away from you, but your salvation can be attacked through your what? Helmet of salvation can be attacked through your thought life. I can remember whenever I first got saved, so excited about being saved. How many of you remember being excited about being saved? You know what the right answer is, Pastor, I'm excited now about being saved. <laughs> but you know what I mean, when you first get saved and you think you're to conquer the world and do it all right then, but I'll tell you something happens over time is that you start focusing on people and, and problems and the church and you know what happens is that we, our joy of our salvation is not really all like it was. When I first got saved, Satan was playing with my mind, it seemed like, because I thought there's no way I can be truly saved. And I want to tell you, I don't think I'm the only one that's ever fallen in that boat that I've questioned my salvation. 
I'm honest enough to tell you that as a believer in Jesus Christ, there had been a time I had questioned my salvation. But you know what I had to do? I had to make sure I had on the helmet of salvation and go back to God's Word and say this, did I confess Him with my mouth? Did I believe in Him with my heart? And if I have done that, am I saved? The answer is yes. Maybe if you have been saved, you need to write down that date in your Bible or put it somewhere else so the next time that Satan tries to convince you you're not saved, you can say, I know I'm saved because I have confessed Jesus. I know I have been saved because I believe in Jesus. I know that I'm saved. You see, salvation is not on feelings. It's not on how you feel. There'll be days you wake up and you're not going to feel saved. You had an argument with your spouse. You had an argument with your children. You had an argument with your boss. You had an argument with the dog. And you don't feel saved. But guess what? I don't know about you, but nowhere in the Bible does it say the way I feel is my spiritual condition. Because there's some days, I will be honest with you, in 20 years of pastoring, I've gotten behind pulpits and I didn't feel like preaching. I didn't. But guess what? It's something amazing happens. You still do what's right and God will do His part as well. Amen? Amen. So, that's the second thing is that we need to make sure that in this battle is that we've got our heads with the helmet of salvation. Why? So that when we are attacked, we can remember we can remember the day we were saved so that when Satan wants us to question our salvation, we can say, I know I am not saved by my works. I'm not saved by anything that my deeds. I am saved based on Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. I am saved by Jesus. That's what we're saved by. And the third, when you're in the spiritual battle, what's come to our minds is this. Imagine great thoughts. That God is able. God's able. God's able. You know, I, I tell you, that whenever the WMU met and they gave me what the missions offering challenge was going to be, $2,000, I thought in my head, oh no. It'd probably be better if we'd just do 1000 That way, if we get the two, we can say, oh, look, you know, you know what I'm saying. You get in your mind, don't you? Because I grew up $2,000 was more than my first car. I remember $2,000 more than some of y'all's first house. Some of you are all that old. Come on. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, right? But you see what happens is that God does something is that when Satan tries to make you feel like God's not able, God will show up and say, don't listen to Satan. Don't listen to Satan. Years ago, I can remember pastoring a church in Roseboro, North Carolina. Have you ever, have you ever heard of Roseboro? Uh, great church. Of, and I was pastoring this church, and the first year I was there, God had put on my heart to encourage the people that in the first year that we were going to pray that 12 people would be saved and baptized and join the church. And so I prayed about that thing, and I told the deacons, I said, we're going to take hands, we're going to pray about this, and I'm going to announce that 12 people, well, we're going to do this, that God's going to work, and we're going to see it happen. And so that Sunday, I got up to challenge the congregation there, and when I did, I opened my mouth, and I said the following. And I said, now we're going to pray that God's put on our hearts and minds that we're going to have 24 people. Where in the world did that come from? I'm going to have 24 people who will be saved and baptized and join the church. At the end, of course, the meeting, deacons had a meeting. Pastor, you told us that we're going to pray about 12. And I said, that's exactly what I said. But when I got up to open my mouth, I don't know where 24 came from. Well, a wise old deacon that was there stood and looked at me and he said, I'll tell you where that came from. That came from God Almighty. And because it come from God, we'll see it happen. And guess what? The last Sunday of that year at that church, 25 people had been baptized, had been saved, and had joined the church. And God had put on my heart this. You go ahead and try to limit me to 12. 
I'll double it and add one. That's what God does. That's what God does. And, and what happens in our minds, we limit God. In our minds, we say, little old Atkinson can't do something. And God says, if you put it in my hands, I can make it something great. But if you try to do it, you always be little old Atkinson. But if you put it in the hand of God, it will be something powerful and mighty and trustworthy. But you've got to believe. That's what you got to do. Woo. I believe there's a reason. I believe there's a reason there's pews that are empty here today. I believe there's a... Hallelujah. I believe there's a reason for that. And the reason I believe is because God's saying, just wait to see what I'm going to do. Amen. You know, maybe one day the choir will have to stay up here because there ain't enough room. Maybe we'll have to get some chairs put on the side. But it'll be God who does it. Amen. Amen? But as long as we keep our minds, oh, we can't do it. Oh, we can't do it. I'm going to tell you something. God can do anything. The last church I pastored had three or four bank accounts. You must say, why do they have so many bank accounts? Well, do you know after you get so much money in the bank, they want you to open another account? I ain't never had that problem. My problem has always been <laughs> the opposite, right? So, they needed to do something. They had almost a million dollars in all these accounts. I sat in a meeting, and as God is my witness, they sat there. And they'd wring their hand, well, we can't touch this money, we can't do this. Maybe we just, maybe we just take up a few dollars. You know, you know that kind of thing. They had like a million dollars, folks. Big church. And I'm going to tell you something. It burned in my soul. And I stood up and I said this. I was a lot bolder than I am now. I stood up and I said this. I said, let me tell you, friends. I said, let's don't mess with any of that money. So that way when the rapture comes, all the sinners can spend it like they want to. <laughs> right? Amen. And they laughed. But I think they were getting it. Wait a minute. God's blessed us. So let's use it for kingdom work. Let's use it for evangelism. Let's use it for missions. Let's use it to see boys and girls saved. God's never blessed a church because of its financial bank account. God's blessed a church because they were on their knees and they were seeking out God. No matter if they were worried about having the money to pay the next light bill, God was still blessing because of faithfulness and not because of finances. So we remember that. Fourth, when the battle of the mind, we must do this. We must nourish a godly mind. My granddaddy used to say this, garbage in. Okay, y'all heard granddaddy say that too. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. Y'all know what that means? Yeah. What you consume, you become. Man, that'll preach just that one statement. What you consume is what you will become. This past Thursday, a dear godly saint, I mean right up there with Mother Teresa, member of our church, saw me at the library up here in Atkinson. She said, Pastor Ken, I got you something. I said, you got me something. I said, oh yes, got you something. She said, I know you're getting sworn in as mayor tonight, and I want to give you a gift. Well, praise the Lord. I like gifts. She pulled out a box of a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> she did. She did. I said, bless the Lord, all oh, my soul and all the calories that shall go in me. 
bless his holy name. So I get home and I have these donuts. My wife says, what are you going to do with those? <laughs> I'm going to test, test them. I said, you know what, if I sit here and eat all dozen of these donuts, I said, I am going to get sick as a dog. I said, but you know what, the sister in Christ gave them to me. <laughs> but then I told her, I said, go ahead. I said, your mama probably wants one. Go ahead, your grandma probably needs one. Your brother, he went last week to Krispy Kreme. He didn't give us one, so he, he didn't get one. But, I, I, but you get where I'm coming at. What you put in your body, what, what happens? You, you start to become, right? I mean, I'm starting to shape out like a donut. But think about this. If it's true the natural, is it not even true with the spiritual? Come on. If you watch garbage on TV all the time, don't you think your mind starts getting corroded with that stuff? Last night we were watching some TV and since we had that little heat in, the, in that room and trying to warm up, we're flipping through the channels and we stop it. And uh, I like to watch, you know, this shows like Snap. You know what Snap is, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like crime shows, you know, what, what made that person do what they did. And uh, we were watching the yeah, NCIS, that kind of stuff. And so we were watching, and this guy, I mean, there was something came on there. And I told Jessica, I said, you're going to have to turn that. I'm I about to throw up. I said, this is so, I mean, it, and it won't, that any, I mean, it was just the, the crime of it was so horrendous. But you know what's happened in our culture is that we have been desensitized to that stuff, right? What used to bother grandma, we don't even think twice about it, right? When schools used to have the major problem was chewing gum and running into hallways, you know what the problems are now? Teen pregnancy, guns, drugs teachers being attacked, right? That's some problems. Man, what if they could bring back your grandma and grandpa right now that have gone on? Wouldn't they be amazed? But you know where it all started? In the mind. Do not think the music industry and the movie industry cares about feeding your mind with godly stuff. It's about wanting to bring more people in, more people in. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So if you're watching something on TV, and I'm not anti-television. I, I mean, I'm not. But what I am is not everything that comes on there has to be watched. Right? You know, sometimes they'll give you free channels. They will. We got Direct TV, and they called us up and they said, Oh, guess what? We're giving you three months of free HBO, free Cinemax, free Showtime, free this, that, and the other. I said, you know, I said, you know what happened to mess on there is garbage anyway. I said, don't you, don't you give me nothing. I said, you can't let me keep my basic package I got. I don't want none of that. You know why? Because what happens when we start consuming that? Come on now. Some of you are feeding on so much pornography right now that you would be ashamed if your mother walked in on you. Now you got quiet there. But it's true. We feed on so much gossip on Facebook, we'd be ashamed if Jesus was our friend on Facebook. Jesus would defriend some of you on Facebook. And he'd block some of the others. Amen? Come on. Last one. In the battle of the mind, you know what we need to do? Keep learning. Romans 12, 2 says this. Be ye transformed in the renewing of your mind. Guess what renewing means? It means that you're doing it constantly. If you can tell me that you read the newspaper more than you read the Bible, then guess what? That is a poor testimony. 
If you spend more time, how many of you got one of these? You got one of these? You got a, a phone? It's got all, I mean, it's got every, I mean, you can find everything in the world on it, right? If you spend more time doing this, whoo, look at that. Ooh, right? We got a whole generation of people of what? Addicted. Addicted. Addicted to it. I've seen it at the barber shop. I've cut people's hair and see five people line up to get, and, and grown men the whole time. Then I'm, you know, in the barber shop, you're supposed to talk about everybody, gossip, you know. Hey, come on. And they'd be sitting there and not one single person talking to another. I have been to restaurants and seen the same thing. I love it. One of my best friends told me that, and he's an older gentleman. He said that he's already told his grandkids and kids, he said, when they come to the house for Christmas, he's got a little Easter basket. And he says, when they come in, he said this, if you're going to eat at Grandma's table, you're going to take some, this right here, and you're going to put it in this basket. Because Grandma worked too hard on that supper and that lunch for you to sit there and disrespect Grandma playing on that phone. Come on now. And he said, if you don't like that, then take your phone and go home. <laughs> and you know what they're going to do? They're going to smell Grandma's cooking. And they're going to put that phone right up. <laughs> now you say, Pastor Kim, why are you talking about all this? Because if you spend more time looking at this... than time looking at this. When you get so worried because this flashes up that you only got 15% battery life, whenever you ain't got any life in this, mm, come on. <laughs> whenever you get more excited when you get a Facebook notification than whenever God's trying to notify you in your mind, come on now. Right? It's a battle of the mind. There's nothing wrong with Facebook. There's no, I'm not against it. But if you consume more of your time on it than you do with God, it becomes a problem. Amen? Amen? There's nothing wrong with the internet. But if you spend more time just surfing garbage and looking at crazy, you know, like on YouTube, two cats fighting. I mean, Really? You see, I'm preaching something you can relate to. Am I right? Right? You spend more time, and Jessica will tell you, yes, I've got my phone out. Now listen to me. i got my phone out a lot, don't I, sweetie? But you know what's on my phone whenever I pull it out? I could show you right now the history. I'm listening. This morning I'm getting dressed. You know what I'm doing? I'm listening to some preaching. I was. I was. I'm li she, she's like... I hear preaching now, here. I mean, you know. But you get what I'm saying, don't you? I, you can use these things that Satan has been using for evil, and you can use it for good. Amen? Come on. You got Bible apps. I know Jamie's got a Bible app on her phone. I know others of you got Bible apps. What I'm getting at is that you can battle the devil with the same things he's battling you with. And so we need to do that. Now let me close, because I know y'all ready to get out of here. Are we in a battle? Yes or no? Yes. We are in a battle. Are we winning the battle or losing the battle? Yes. It just depends, right? Yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying you're right or wrong, but it just depends. But there is a battle. And there are, and, and you know, this is one of the things, both of you are right. Some of you say, oh, we're winning. Some said you're losing. Guess what? You're both right. Because there's days you will win the battle because you've been more focused on Jesus than you were focused on anything else. Right? But there will be days that you're going to be losing that battle if you change your focus. Why? Because the battle is here. Your thought life. Right? Right? The next time you want to blow up at somebody, think about this. Is it good? Is it pleasant? 
Is it pure? Is it holy, what I'm about to say? Is it true? And, and if all those things meet the criteria, say this, the way I'm going to respond to that person, would I respond to Jesus the same way? You say, but they ain't Jesus. <laughs> but you know what? You have Jesus in you, right? So what am I getting at? I'm getting at today, the battle rages. The battle's on. But you're going to determine the way you fight this fight if you will leave victorious or will you allow Satan to defeat you. More marriages have been defeated. Why? Because of the battle of the mind. More children have run away from home and, and got into drugs and everything else because they entered and lost the battle of the mind. We need to reclaim our society with the mind. The mind. So, let's pray.